Greetings, brothers and sisters. We received great news last week regarding house of worship. You probably received Billy's email yesterday, so the church will be reopening on Sunday, April 4th, with an 11 a.m. Easter service. This is an excellent opportunity for us to be able to worship together again in person, and especially to celebrate our Lord's resurrection, Christ is risen. It's certainly a very exciting time for all of us, and all the elders are looking forward to it. So today we continue our series on 1 Peter. We are looking at chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Let me read those verses to you. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. In verse 12, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong thing, of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Let me briefly recap what we have seen so far in chapter 2. First, Peter compares believers to newborn infants and saying all Christians are to be like infants in their longing for pure spiritual milk, which likely refers to God's word. They will continue to crave for the word to long for the word, if they have tasted the Lord is good. So, as we continue in fellowship with Christ, we keep going with our relationship with him, we are built up uh, as spiritual house. So, as we suffer rejection, persecution, so keep in mind, Jesus was also rejected by men. So now he's risen from the dead and consequently is the, the living stone, the foundation of God's new temple. He is God's chosen one, the cornerstone. And as the exalted Lord is honored above all, believers are not only God's temple, but also are a uh, holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter clearly indicates our position in Christ. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, we belong to Christ, as Denny mentioned it last, last week. We are not the author of our salvation. He is. Peter is clearly telling, telling us who we are in Christ. Only God's grace can explain why some people come to faith and others do not. God has chosen some to be his people. Therefore, no one can boast of being included. Peter is saying, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We were far away from God, but now by being born again, we have the Spirit of God lives in us. We were spiritually dead, dead in our trespasses. He made us alive with Christ. He made us His. Now we are the people of God, redeemed by the precious blood of His Son shed on the cross. So we have God's nature in us. His glory lives in us. We become a partaker of His divine nature 
meaning that the characteristics of God's nature become our own. Righteousness, gentleness, joyful, patient become our own. Notice that after Peter finishing to expose our position in Christ, our privileges, and who we are in Christ, now in verse 11, he used the, the word beloved, dear friends, to warm up his exhortations. It's a very kind way to begin his exhortation and remind his readers that they are loved. By the way, this is a good principle for all believers to follow. Before you and I exhort someone, we need to begin with beloved, with dear friends, which has a way of affirming that the one being addressed is beloved. In this case, Peter is saying to them, they are loved by God. So Peter is saying, dear friends, I exhort you, I urge you, I beg you in a passionate way as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Peter is calling us to exercise discipline from the inside. Friends, let me tell you, if we want to be an excellent tool to win unbelievers for Christ, in other words, if we want to be an excellent tool to live a godly life on the outside in general, we are to start living a godly life from the inside, meaning that we keep our integrity when we are alone, when we are in a private mode, when, when no one is watching us. Notice that Peter identifies us as foreigners and exiles. Some translations use aliens and strangers, but the idea is we do not belong in the, in the society we are in. We are a foreigner. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. As we sing, the world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are led up somewhere beyond the blue. Friends, be encouraged by those words when persecution, trials, health issues, and so on come to your way. Friends, I, I would like you, I would like to encourage you to see in that in a, a, a real privilege. It's a privilege to be made a citizen of heaven. The price of that privilege is that while we are a citizen of heaven, we are a stranger here. We are a foreigner in a land that is not our own. We are in the world but we are not of the world. We are a visitor who makes a brief stay. I would like you, I would like to remind you the context in which Peter's readers lived. They were exiles, scattered th throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, first Peter first first Peter chapter one, living among people with other values, other beliefs, but Peter wanted to encourage them by telling them whatever country you might be, be encouraged that you don't belong there. You are a foreigner. Same as Peter's first readers, we will always have to live among unbelievers before going to our eternal home. 
but we have to exercise discipline to have an impact on the world in which we must live. How do we do that? By abstaining from sinful desires. To stay away from sinful desires. To keep our distance from, from sinful desires. To keep our distance from the desires of our falling nature. Peter is fully aware of the spiritual battle going on inside of us. That's why he commands us to be disciplined to stay away from sinful desires. How, why we do have this battle? Why do we have this battle going on inside of us? Let me explain you. As we have seen earlier, God called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. We belong to him. So we are saved, we become Christ followers, we are God's special possession. We have God's nature in us. So this nature, this new nature that God gave us is battling the flesh. This new nature is fighting the flesh. But it's not an easy thing to do. When we all know that we, we all have some cute little sin some favorite sin inside of us that we cherish. And we know that we have to let them go when this new nature takes place. So this is a great challenge for, for the Holy Spirit in us to give us victory. So it's, it's, it's a battle. Let me mention that sinful desires are not only relate, related to sexual immorality. Peter means strong desires of our depraved nature, strong desires of our wicked flesh. If you, if you would like to have an idea about, about what flesh produces, let's see, let's see Galatians 5 verse 19. As we read, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, and purity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. It's very tempting to go back to live the way we used to live. The Christian's agony comes from realizing that our sinful flesh refuses to respond to the requirements of God's word. Friends, let me tell you, things which we as Christians despise, we find ourselves doing. Things which we as Christians desire, we fail to accomplish. No matter how much we may wish to serve God in our minds, we find ourselves sinning in our bodies. As Paul describes his frustration in Romans 7 with his mind, he desires to serve God. He agrees with the law of God and rejoices in it. Paul wants to do what is right, but his body will not respond. Our fleshy bodies refuse to obey God. When we want to do what pleases the Lord, what delights Him, our fleshy bodies quickly and eagerly respond to the impulses and desires caused by sin. The weakness of our flesh is the root problem which prevents us from living the kind of lives God requires and which we as Christians desire in our innermost being. If in Romans 7, Paul exposes the weakness of our flesh, but in Romans 8, in chapter 8, 
it provides the solution. In other words, those of us willing to honestly identify with the agony of Romans 7 will be ready for the joy of God's gracious provision for living righteously in Romans 8. I would like to encourage you to read those chapters from the book of Romans. A wonderful word. So the exposition of the weakness of our flesh in Romans 7 is to prepare us for God's provision for godly living in Romans 8. So we have got sinful desires attached to our unredeemed humanness. And it will be redeemed someday when we see Christ, when we will be in glory with him, what we call glorification. And we will be forever and ever with him. So sinful desires are all strong desires of the depraved flesh, and we must abstain from them because they wage war against the soul. And James said, what causes fight and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Friends, there's a war going on inside of us. There's a war inside of us. It's a raging war. It's a spiritual war. It's a spiritual warfare. Wage war is a very strong term. It's a military term which means to carry on a military campaign. It's a long-term campaign. It's an ongoing war. Notice Peter has personified the sinful desires to help us understand the war. In Peter's mind, it's like an army of rebels who try to capture, enslave, and destroy our soul. Friends, we have to stay away from them. And John puts it in a really clear way. Do not love the world or anything in the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Friends, let me remind you, when we give sinful desires any space in our lives, we give them the advantage in their malicious aggression against us. So you're probably wondering, how should we win the war? How should we be victorious? First, we need to be aware that we are at war. And we are to walk by the Spirit, live by the Spirit, Galatians 5. Because when we walk by the Spirit, we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. We must, put, we must put on the full armor of God, Ephesians 6, to win the battle going on inside of us. When you have some time, you can go and read Ephesians 6 to, to have an idea about the, 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 the weapons that we use to fight and to win the battle going on inside of us. We are to stay vigilant, disciplined, and be strong in the Lord. Friends, we are at war. Let yourself be led by the, by the Holy Spirit to win the war. And the sinful desires wage war against our soul. They want to destroy us. They want to capture, to enslave and destroy our soul. By the soul, Peter means the person, you as a living being. That is not a simple, a simple part of you, 
that's the whole person himself or herself because when man was created he became a living soul so peter commands us to stay away from sinful desires which wage war against our whole person so now let's go to verse 12 leave such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong they may see your good deeds and glorify god on the day he visits us now peter is talking about how are we supposed to live among those who don't know Christ, among those who are unsaved? Friends, let me tell you, if we want to be an effective tool for evangelism, we need to start living a righteous life. We need to start living a godly life. By living a godly life, we win people for Christ and so we silence critics take a look on verse 15 first Peter chapter 2 for a minute as we read for it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people in other words, you not only silence their criticism, but you bring them to the point where they glorify God by, by, by what you do, not what you say. That's why we need to start living a godly life. Peter refers to what Jesus said and recorded in Matthew 5 verse 16 let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven in other words be a shining light I have a, a friend uh, who, who, who always who, who always says be a shining light a shining light wherever you go wherever you are in the neighborhood in the home in the school on the job be a shining light keep keep on shining wherever in such a way that we may without a word by the behavior of our lives of our lives of our transformed life lives demonstrate the very the viability of the Christian gospel and put to silence the attacks of Christianity's critics let me repeat that when we are a shining light we silence the attacks of Christianity's critics so wherever in a such way that we may without a word by the behavior of our lives demonstrate the, vi the viability of the Christian gospel and put to silence the attacks of Christianity's critics so we need to be an example among those who are not saved those who don't know Christ so Peter means the quality of our regenerated life, of our transformed life, of our new nature must be visible to the unsaved. So we need to keep an excellent and honest behavior among them. Why? Because by doing so, when they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. Always keep in mind the context Peter was writing. The pagans accused the Christians of all kinds of things, rebelling against the Roman government and all other human authority. Peter is saying, 
keep doing good things. Keep having an excellent behavior among them. Live an excellent life among them. Live a life that is honorable. The purpose of doing that is, as those who don't know Christ continue to observe your good deeds, they will end up glorifying God on the day He visits us. Because of, because of the ongoing observation of our character, of the character and quality of our transformed lives, of our transformed lives, an unbeliever will glorify God in the day God visits him to save him. He will remember the lives of faithful Christians, but those who don't believe will experience the visitation of his wrath in the final judgment. So let's keep in mind that the most effective tool of evangelism we possess is the power of a righteous life. God sees us through his son. When he sees us because of the death of and resurrection of his son, he no longer sees our guilt, our shame. But he sees the righteousness of, the righteousness of his son, the holiness of his son, who takes residence in us. He gave us his nature. We have new identity. He gave us spiritual privileges. It's not because we deserve it, but because of his love. He called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. We belong to him. We are God's special possession. Let us remember that we are travelers. We are foreigners. We are looking for the city that is to come, our eternal home. God called us to stay away from sinful desires, which wage war against our soul. Sinful desires always hurt the soul. They do serious injury to the body. It calls us to live a regenerated life, a transformed life among the, the unsaved, among those who don't know him. A life that silences the critics because there is nothing to criticize. He calls us to live an excellent life that brings unbelievers to believe in Christian faith because its transforming power can be seen in our lives and consequently it becomes an attraction to Christ. Alexander McLaren, the great Scottish pre uh, preacher, wrote, the world takes its notions of God most of all from the people who say that they belong to God's family. They read us a great deal more than they read the Bible. In fact, they see us, they only hear about Jesus Christ. Let me conclude with Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless you, beloved friends.